Hey there, I'm Dr. Jerry Crete. Welcome to Be With The Word. This week we're looking at the 25th Sunday of Ordinary Time. I'm actually going to bring in a little bit from the 24th as well because I missed last week, but I'm so excited to be with you. And uh, this is where I explore the Sunday readings from a psychological perspective. And this week I have a few messages that may also touch on the political. Now, as you know, you may know, um, we tend to avoid talking about politics in Be With The Word. Our focus is faith and psychology. But sometimes we can't help it. There are some elements that come up in our world that might be worth mentioning, and I'm going to bring in a few of those. The topic today, all right, and you might see why I'm mentioning politics, the topic today is how to present the truth and how to accept persecution. And I really drew from our readings for this topic, but I was also reflecting on our modern times. Now, I am going to be very careful to avoid presenting a particular political view. It's not my job to tell you how to think or how to vote or how to, you know, what your position should be on these really complicated uh, matters in our world. But I will, from a Catholic perspective, from a scriptural perspective, uh, bring in some psychological elements that might help to frame things and might help to be able to figure out a good way, a faithful way to approach difficult topics. No matter where you are on the political spectrum, no matter what your position is on this or that. So let me know if I fail to do that. Feel free to mention it. I'm going to make a real effort uh, not to take a position. Uh, I will say I do take a few positions that are consistent with our Catholic faith that are clear and undisputed. So that I'm not going to really um, parse. I'm not, you know, I'm going to be clear on Catholic positions that um, may require some nuance and may require some reflection, but 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 sometimes are pretty clear, right? Like I think as a marriage and family therapist, for example, who works with Catholics, I am never going to advocate for adultery or I'm never actually going to even advocate for a divorce. It can always be someone's choice, but it isn't going to be something I am going to promote. Um, all right. So let's get into this. Why is this coming up? Well, the reading from the Book of Wisdom is kind of interesting because it sounds like they're annoyed by somebody, someone who's being obnoxious to us, and they want to basically torture him. And their response is, well, if we torture him and he's on God's side, well, God will protect him. Well, that sounds a lot like the way Jesus was treated, right? And the priests were like, well, you know, save yourself. If God, if you really are the son of God, you'll be able to save yourself. And we know actually this isn't typically the way that God works. Um, it's very interesting. Uh, the relationship between God's actions and human suffering is really interesting. And the readings, uh, sorry, the Psalms, um, are always interesting this week and the week before are about the Lord upholds my life, but also that the Lord walks with me, right? And so I think that there are times when, of course, you are um, protected by God, but there are also times when God walks with you through suffering rather than just simply makes the suffering go away, which, of course, we all want. Okay, um, I think it's also interesting that when we get into the, um, the gospel reading for this week, it's about Jesus admitting that he is going to die and doesn't want it known. So, in other words, Jesus has a purpose in dying. It's not about preventing Jesus from dying. It's about doing a mission. It's about having a reason, even if the reason isn't always clear. In the present moment. So that takes a lot of faith to get there. Okay, I want to bring up the element of the truth and how to engage people in any kind of discussion about matters of truth. And the ones, the two topics that come up for me right now, um, the big one right now is the question of abortion because 
at this time, uh, as I'm as I'm air, uh, recording this, there is the heartbeat law in Texas, and uh, that's getting a lot of attention in the media. And the other topic that is sort of more generally um, uh, talked about, and, and, and perhaps for some is a concern, but is uh, the topic of um, uh, people who are trans. And as a Catholic, we are kind of running up against a few problems because in the first place, um, the Catholic Church would take the position, you know, has historically and even consistently still takes the position that abortion is a moral evil. The Catholic Church um, hasn't said a whole lot about the trans issue overall, really, but it tends to take a position um, that you are born one particular sex and one particular gender. And, you know, you can't change that. That's how God created you. Okay, so those are the positions the Catholic Church historically takes. Okay, why am I bringing this up? If you are going to engage with somebody, you need to not engage on the right or wrong of abortion or the right or wrong of someone taking on a trans identity, at least not at the beginning, because those kind of discussions are always going to be doomed to fail. They're almost certainly going to result in arguments back and forth that are going to miss each other, right? And so those will usually end up in people getting more excited more stressed, more anxious, more angry, and at the end of the day, not a whole lot good comes out of it. And I don't know if you've ever been on those. Those happen sometimes on social media like Facebook. People get into these kind of arguments. Sometimes they might even happen, happen within families or among friends, and, and it can ruin relationships. So I think there's a different way to approach it. I think we have to admit and be honest about and lay out the worldview and the philosophical and psychological underpinnings of that worldview. And we have to at least admit before engagement with another person where we are on that spectrum and have a discussion about that. If the other person is unable to understand what you're talking about in that or unwilling to engage it and explore it, then they're not going to be a person you're ever going to be able to have a reasonable discussion with. Okay, so I'm going to explain what I mean by that. Um, until, I don't know, um, the 20th century, um, most people believed that there was such a thing as objective truth. Certainly, um, pre-Middle Ages and before, everyone assumed it. And we all understood that there was a truth to be known. So, you know, go back all the way to Aristotle, Plato. However, they understood that truth to be known. You know, Plato would have said the truth exists in some kind of forms that one has to understand these objective forms that live outside of, I don't know, our universe or whatnot, that, that, that everything on earth is a reflection of. Or Aristotle might have said, you know, we're going to analyze all the, you know, elements of something around the world and that we understand what it is. But there's still a truth to be found. And this was true all the way up. Even in the in, even in the like so-called scientific revolution, even when you get into the 16th, 17th, 18th century, the scientists believed, because they had a scientific hypothesis, that there was a truth to be found. We come up with a hypothesis that has to be tested in order to discover what the truth is. Okay, so if you believe that there is a truth to be found, then you believe in objective truth. And you believe that um, there are some essentials, and those essentials don't change. So I might say, I'm male, and I've always been male. I was male from birth. 
You could argue that I was male <laughs> um, in God's mind. I don't know. But you could, uh, I will grow up and I will always be male. There's no, that's essential to who I am. And it's just a biological truth. And it's just a truth. Okay. Um, if you take the abortion position, you could say, well, something is uh, a human. It has genetic material that's human from the pretty much, I think, the moment of conception. You have new genetic material. You have a heartbeat eventually. You have um, behaviors in the womb that indicate this is a human being. It's not some other kind of being. And so it's objectively a human being that's inside another person. And so from an objective truth perspective, you would have to argue, I think, that that is a truth, that that is a human being. You can get into arguments about personhood. You can get into arguments of viability. You could, but you can't really argue that it's not a human being. Uh, and, you know, so that, so that we get the roots of, of the pro-life in a position uh, in, in that essential truth. Okay? So if you argue it with somebody from that position, they're going to likely try to argue, right, the rights of the, the say, the mother, and they're going to argue it um, to perhaps say that um, the rights of the mother supersede or that maybe they would argue there's not really a human being. Who knows? There's, you get it, but you see what happens. It gets into a big argument. All right, so why am I bringing all this up? I want to point out that we no longer live in either, certainly not a medieval or even a renaissance or even a modern um, world mindset. It has changed, and it's been changing for quite a while. We are now living in a world that is about deconstructivism. We are living in a world that one sometimes calls postmodern. We are living in a world where subjective truth is the norm. And until you admit that difference, you can't have a reasonable discussion with another person. So the discussion has to be, you know, do we agree with an objective truth? Um, position or do we agree with the subjective truth position? Do we take a, um, even a, it would be considered a modern liberal approach, or do we take a postmodern deconstructivist approach? If you don't understand what I mean by a postmodern deconstructivist approach, I will explain it to you in a moment. And hopefully you will get it, and hopefully you will see why any arguments and discussions you've had in the past haven't really worked. It's just not effective. This is why. Okay. A post-deconstructive, modern, uh, post-modern approach basically believes there is no truth to be known objectively. All truth is created by us. All right. I hope that makes sense. And if you don't have this position, then a lot of people seem very absurd who hold that position. It's as if they have lost their minds. And if you have a postmodern deconstructivist position, the other side appears strangely rigid and strangely backwaters and impossible also to understand. So that's why this is so important. And I'm going to illustrate the point. Um, I don't know a lot of people, uh, couples, young, say married couples who um, are hoping to get pregnant, get pregnant, how they don't say, we're having a baby how they don't get excited and, you know, prepare for a baby and talk about it as a baby and actually, you know, even possibly name it or play music to the baby and they do all these things. All right. Meanwhile, another couple who don't happen to want a baby, 
Maybe it's extraordinarily inconvenient timing. Maybe there are financial problems. Maybe there are marital problems. Maybe there's just lots of reasons why having a baby would be horrible at that time. And if they choose to have an abortion, they don't refer to it as a baby. They're not referring to it as an, they refer to it as an unwanted pregnancy. So in their mind, truth has to be subjective. Because if their friend down the street said, oh, we're pregnant, we're having a baby, they would go, oh, congratulations, I'm so excited. Do you want a boy or a girl, right? They would treat somebody else, this is having a baby, as a good thing. And they would even call it a baby. If they're in a situation where it's a horrible problem, they would call it an unwanted pregnancy and possibly evoke the right to terminate the pregnancy because it's inconvenient. In order for that to make any sense logically, then the right to life or the value or the meaning of that baby is determined by the person. So if it's unwanted pregnancy, then the value of that life is zero. If it's a desired pregnancy, then the value of that life is everything. And in fact, if they lost that baby, they would be crushed. So here we're working from a postmodern position that the value of something is um, given to it by the subject, the subject, the person. It's not something given by God. It's not something given by the universe or Plato's forms or Aristotle's observations around the world. It's it is by the subject. The same can be said for other things, such as me being male. If I was to say, which I am not, but if I was to say I am really female, in fact, I've always felt female, and I'm going to change my appearance and my name and my identity, and I am going to become female. In fact, I was always that way. I just have been you know, living in this uncomfortable male existence, then there are people who would celebrate that change. There are also people who would see me as possibly having some kind of disorder, right? And they might feel sorry for me. There might also be people who are like, well, you're not female. You're object you have male body parts. You are male in every possible way. You've lived your whole life as a male. Everybody sees you as male. You're biologically male, right? So the postmodern position, would a deconstructivist position, would argue, I can deconstruct who I am and reconstruct it to whatever I want. The objective truth position, the positivist position, would say that I can't, that I am what I am, like it or not. The middle position would say, if you're confused about it, there must be some kind of disorder and you need help, right? So these are the three positions that usually appear. When I'm, so how does this even, I know I'm talking a lot of philosophy and I'm talking a bit of politics. Why am I bringing it up at all? At all? Well, when I have seen these kind of issues come up in a clinical setting, and we have family members who are in opposition to each other, I don't want to get into the arguments that are so typically done over things like, you know, I have a right to my body or you're killing a baby versus or you're uh, I'm trans and, and, and you have to accept it and or um, I, you were born this. And so I don't overly want to get into those discussions because they're not helpful, not until we've all admitted where we are in the spectrum, that we begin by saying, I come from a worldview that says there is an objective truth to be known. And the other side has to be made aware, and maybe they will accept it, and maybe they won't be too comfortable with it. But I'm coming from a position that says everything, including our names, including words in our language, including our bodies, including our 
society is all up uh, for change. We can deconstruct our world and we can reconstruct it. Okay. We need to admit where we are because otherwise the argument makes no sense. Okay, so that's probably my big message. I've already talked for way longer than I expected to today. I guess I got on a roll. I hope you're still listening and you haven't tuned me out by now because I do want to link this to the gospel because what does the gospel actually tell us? And I think James really does say important things to help us with this. He says that we need um, to speak from wisdom from a pure heart. Okay, so that can be a bit general. Then he's specific. We need to be peaceable, gentle, compliant, full of mercy, and have good fruits. And we need to be sincere. Okay, so after admitting and being honest about what position you have philosophically, that's at least just laying the groundwork for why we disagree and why we're coming at it from such different places. We need to be willing to listen and understand the other person's worldview and hear them speak about it. We need to really understand and question gently and nicely, but question that worldview because sometimes people do pick and choose between worldviews. And sometimes their position is not 100% consistent. And that's true on both sides. And so it's important to ask them, you know, are there things in the world that you do believe are objectively true and knowable? Because if everything is, you can deconstruct everything, that is is interesting (laughs) and may present some problems. And I think somebody having to explain that about their own view might open up those problems. The other thing that is so important, so important, and he talks about sincerity. James talks about sincerity. And so I say, speak from the heart. Don't try to change minds so much as change hearts. All right? doesn't mean lose your mind, but it means... You know, talk if you're if you're honest about your worldview and you talk about what it means to you, it's a lot harder to crush another person. In other words, I remember I met Mother Teresa. Um, well, and it was in a crowd, so it wasn't really a meeting. I saw Mother Teresa, and she said from the heart, "Do not kill the babies; give them to me." It was so honest. It was so sincere. It was so from the heart. And I think that we have to speak from there. I think too often we get riled up and angry and we're fighting each other and we have to win the argument. But when we win the argument, we lose the heart. Okay? And so we need to be gentle and very, have lots of mercy and really, we need to appreciate that most people actually do have goodwill. Even a person who we disagree with vehemently has a reason, and usually it's a heart reason, for believing in their position. And the only way to change that heart, if it's to be changed, is to meet it heart to heart. We have to have humility. In the gospel, Jesus talks about being like a child right? So again, not being first. He says the first will be last. If our goal is to win the argument, then we're acting like we want to be first and we will be last. All right. He also says there's no shame if you're persecuted. So as long as you're coming at it sincerely from your heart and you're explaining why this matters to you, I think the other person will at least have to listen. And if they have to listen, that's a good thing. Whether or not, you know, they agree or change their minds, you've got to leave that to God. You've got to leave that to the Holy Spirit. The other thing I think is interesting is there's also mention of faith without works is dead in James the week before. But in this reading, it says good fruits is also a, a, a product. 
So, I mean, I was encouraged by reading the governor of, no, it wasn't the governor, it was a representative in Texas who wrote the bill, the heartbeat bill. And I was encouraged that he said that people may not know this, but Texas this year has given $100 million to uh, women in difficult pregnancies to pay for diapers and car seats and uh, doctor's visits and counseling visits and all this kind of thing. So sometimes pro-lifers get accused of only caring about birth, but don't care about the mother afterward, leave, leave them in poverty. And I don't know if maybe $100 million is, is not enough. It, it probably isn't, but at least that is something. And I want to see more of that. I do think as Christians, if we take a position that is a pro-life stand, we have to show that we are willing to sacrifice out of love for people in difficult situations and in difficult pregnancies, or we will just be seen as hypocrites. Um, and I do think that is a Christian calling overall. So, okay. Wow. I was on a bit of a bandwagon, I think, this week. And uh, I hope that you take from this um, not... Um, something about the argument or what position to have so much as A, recognize what worldview you're coming from and B, change the game of the discussion. Now, just because you do and you come at it from a heart place, from a sincere, loving, kind, gentle, full of mercy, like James is talking about, if you come at it from there, it doesn't mean you won't still be beaten or have somebody spit in your face, hopefully just metaphorically. Um, and, and, and the gospel have an answer, the, the Bible has an answer for that. It says, God will, you, you are not disgraced, God walks with you, and God will be there with you f- through that. Um, and so we need to hold on to that. But we need to be um, self-reflective at the same time and make sure we are staying, from a parts perspective, I would say stay in the self. But I would also add always relying on the Holy Spirit to guide and protect and, 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 and uh, support your humility and allow you to stay humble. All right. That's what I've got for you guys today. <laughs> uh, I love to hear comments. Obviously, feel free to disagree with me on this. Um, I, I try to not present a position, but I am Catholic, so it's going to be a little hard for, for certain positions not to kind of be reflected there. Um, I hope you might join me on soulsandhearts.com. Check out all of our resources. If you're male and you're a Catholic, and, or if you know a male who's Catholic, who's looking for community and support, come join me on catholicjourneyman.com. It's an online community, and we have small groups and office hours and web meetings and all kinds of cool things going on there. Um, I'm, I'm also on Hallow, so feel free to check me out on Hallow, part of a mental health series there. And I hope to be doing some writing soon with Exodus 90 as well. So I'm keeping super busy, and I hope you'll join me and, uh, and all these different activities. God bless, and until next time, be still, believe, be loved. Take good care.